Blur filters are everywhere. They reduce noise, reveal image structures at different scales, protect privacy, and create the beautiful depth of field effects that make subjects pop. But how do they actually work? In this video, you and I will break it down step by step. Along our journey, we will also uncover powerful ideas such as convolution, the Fourier transform, and the surprising connection between them. To a computer, a color image is made up of red, green, and blue channels. If we look closer, you will see it's just a grid of numbers, ranging from 0 to 255, representing color intensity. To understand blurring, let's simplify. We will use a low-resolution image and focus only on luminance. The same blurring process applies to color images, just down separately for each channel. So given this input image, how do we blur it? A simple approach is to average the intensity values in a small neighborhood. Here is how it works. We take a 3x3 patch of the image, sum up all the values, divide by 9, and place the result in the output image. Then we slide to the next pixel and repeat. The entire operation is defined by a 3x3 grid of coefficients, called a kernel. Once we process every pixel, we get the blur image on the right. We can increase the blur by using a larger kernel, averaging pixel intensities over a bigger area. But hold on, what about the pixels at the edges? One common fix is to extend the image by duplicating or reflecting border pixels. But what's up with these weird artifacts? Even with a larger blur kernel, the image still isn't perfectly smooth. Let's test it with a simple pattern, vertical stripes. The result, box filter struggles to smooth out fine details. How do we fix this? Well, the box filter treats all the pixels in the neighborhood equally. But what if we give more weight to pixels closer to the center? That could create a smoother, natural blur. This is called Gaussian filter. We can control the amount of blur using the standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel. A larger value creates a blurrier image. Now let's compare the result of box blur with that of Gaussian blur. The difference is clear. Gaussian blur is much smoother. But why? Why does changing the way we average pixels make such a huge difference? Hmm. To answer that, we need to look at the blur filters through the lens of signal processing, specifically convolution, the Fourier transform, and their deep connections. The input image is a signal, and blurring is a system that processes the signal to produce an output. To build intuition, let's simplify things with a 1D example. Think of it like a scan line in an image. Here we have an input signal f, the system as a function t that transforms the input signal f into the output signal g. Now the system we care about have two key properties. The first property is linearity. This means that scaling the input scales the output by the same vector. The more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. Also, if we split the input signal into two parts, f1 and f2, process them with our system separately, and sum the results, the output remains the same as if we process f directly. The second property is shift invariance. This means that shifting the input signal causes the corresponding shift in the output signal without changing shape. So what can we do with such linear shift invariant systems? We can decompose any signal f into a collection of scale and shifted impulse signals. Then we process each impulse separately to produce response from these impulse signals. Due to the linearity and shift invariance, we know that the outputs are scaled and shift impulse response edge. And summing out all these responses reconstructs the final output g. Let's formalize this. We start with expressing the input signal as a summation of scale and shifted impulse signals. The linearity lets us move the function t inside the sum. Now, because the system is also shift invariant, the system's response to an impulse at position k is just the impulse response h shifted by k. So to understand what an LSI system does to any signal, we only need to see what it does to a single impulse. This operation is known as convolution. 
Here's another way to see it. The output G at position X is a weighted sum of nearby values with weights given by the impulse response. This shows how we can implement a blur filter using convolution. Here, H is the system's impulse response. The negative sign indicates that the filtering kernel is the impulse response flipped horizontally and vertically. For blur filter, this flipping doesn't matter because they are symmetric. But this still doesn't answer the big questions, where do those annoying artifacts come from? To crack this mystery, we need to step back and see the signal from a whole new perspective. Let's start with a 2D example. We know that any point on this plane can be described by just two numbers. Formally, we express the 2D vector P as a linear combination of basis vectors. The basis vector V1 and V2 are just unit vectors for the X and Y axis. We can write this concisely as matrix vector multiplication by stacking basis vectors as columns. Now finding the coefficients is simple. Just invert the basis matrix. This shows that we can find the coefficient A1 by computing the dot product between the basis vector V1 and the data point P. Same goes for A2. Now this seems like overcomplicating something so straightforward. But this intuition will be crucial when we represent the same 2D vector P using different bases. Here we have new basis vectors U1 and U2. Similarly, we can express P as a linear combination of U1 and U2. To find the coefficients C1 and C2, we just need to compute the inner product between the basis vector and our data point P. Let's take this concept further. For a signal with n numbers, we can represent it as a point in an n-dimensional vector space. At first glance, this can be trivially expressed as the linear combination of the standard basis. But here is where it gets interesting. We want to express the same signal using a new basis. One choice of basis is the cosine waves with varying frequencies. Here is the angular frequency omega k tells us how many cycles each basis has. For example, omega 1 has 1 cycle, omega 2 has 2 cycles, and so on. The phase fine specifies how far the function is shifted horizontally from its usual position. By finding the right phase shift and amplitude, we can reconstruct the original signal by adding these waves together. In the actual equation, we have a normalization constant 1 over n, but for simplicity, we will ignore it first and bring it back later. Before we compute the coefficient ck, we need to have fixed basis vectors. But here's the catch, the phase shift depends on the data. So we need to decouple them. Luckily, we can turn to the cosine addition formula from high school. It says that cosine a plus b equals to cosine a times cosine b minus sine a times sine b. Applying this formula, we get this expression. Shoveling the terms around, we see that our signal x can be expressed as a linear combination of cosine and sine waves. These cosine and sine waves forms an orthogonal basis that no longer depends on the data. Let's call these coefficients ak and bk. Similar to the 2D case, we find the coefficients ak and bk by computing the dot product between the signal x and the basis vectors. This is the core idea of discrete Fourier transform. It tells us that we can express a signal x as a weighted sum of cosine and sine waves of varying frequencies. But it's not very convenient to keep track of two bases and two sets of coefficients. Let's see how we can simplify this with Aurier formula. It says that when we raise e to an imaginary power, we describe a point on a unit circle in a complex plane. This gives a way to bundle the cosine and sine functions together into a single elegant expression. By expressing cosine and sine functions as complex exponentials, we arrive at this equation. Now let's group the terms for e i omega k x and e minus i omega k x. The negative sign here is a bit annoying. The omega k is 2 pi k divided by n. This is equivalent to 2 pi times n minus k divided by n. Intuitively, 
we can arrive at exactly the same point on a unicycle by either rotating an angle theta clockwise or rotating an angle of 2 pi minus theta counterclockwise. Alright, so we can replace the negative omega k with a positive omega n minus k. Since summing over k from 0 to n minus 1 is the same as n minus 1 to 0, we can use change of variable so that we have a n minus k and b n minus k. Recall that the coefficient a k is the inner product between the signal and the cosine basis vector. a n minus k is the same as a k because cosine is an even function. Similarly, the coefficient bk is the inner product between the signal and the sine basis vector. b n minus k is negative pk because sine is an R function. We now see that these two parts turns out to be the same. Let's bring the normalization factor back and simplify the coefficient as ck. This gives us the inverse discrete Fourier transform. It tells us that we can represent a signal x using a sum of sinusoidal basis functions with different frequencies weighted by the coefficient ck. To find that coefficient, we can use discrete Fourier transform. The coefficient ck is a complex number. The magnitude encodes the strength of a particular frequency present in the input signal x. The phase encodes the horizontal shift of the sinusoidal basis functions. Now we are ready to explore what a linear and shift invariant system do to a signal. For LSI system, the output G is the convolution between the input signal F and the impulse response H. But what does the discrete Fourier transform of this output signal G look like? We can plug the convolution equation in and shuffle things around. Now let's set P equals to N minus M, which means N equals to P plus M. We can then group these two terms together in a clever way. And then something incredible happens. It turns out the DFT of the output signal is simply the multiplication of the DFT of the input signal and the DFT of the impulse response edge. This is known as convolution theorem. Let's see what this means using this particular example. We will first apply the DFT to the input signal and visualize the magnitude of the coefficients. This shows us the strength of sinusoidal signals at different frequencies. Indexes closer to the sensors represent lower frequencies, while those further out represent higher frequencies. Next, we compute the DFT of the impulse response edge. This reveals a bell-shaped curve where the value gradually decreases for high frequencies. Here is the DFT of the output signal G. Thanks to the convolution theorem, we can see that the blur filter suppresses the high frequency components in the input signal F. And by applying the inverse DFT, we can reconstruct the blur signal G. Same analysis applies to 2D images. We start by applying the 2D discrete Fourier transform to the input image and visualize the magnitude of coefficients. These coefficients are now 2D, corresponding to horizontal and vertical frequencies. When we apply the 2D DFT to a box filter, we see these blocky patterns in the frequency domain. As a result, here is what the DFT of the output image looks like. This explains why box filters struggle to remove certain high frequency components, leading to those annoying visual artifacts. Now let's look at Gaussian blur. The DFT of a Gaussian kernel is also a Gaussian in the Fourier domain. This creates a smooth low pass filter that effectively remove high frequency components from the input image. When we increase the standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel, it removes even more frequency components, resulting in a more blurry image. The Gaussian filter makes a great blur filter. But how do we actually compute it? The Gaussian function is continuous, while images are discrete, so we need to create a discrete version of the Gaussian function. Here is the equation of Gaussian function with variance 0.2. A simple approach is to sample the continuous curve at certain points to get the coefficients. We then renormalize them so that the sum equals 1. This works fine as is. But very often we want to construct a progressively blur output by iteratively applying the Gaussian filter. In the continuous domain, there is a nice property. Convolving two Gaussian functions 
gives another Gaussian with a larger variance. Unfortunately, this doesn't hold in the discrete case. When we iteratively convolve the discretized Gaussian, we end up with a kernel that deviates from the true Gaussian. Fortunately, there is an effective approximation using binomial filter. Before normalization, binomial filters have integer coefficients, making them more efficient for hardware computations. Here is a binomial filter that approximates a Gaussian with variance 0.5. The best part, convolving two binomial filters gives another binomial filter. By applying a simple three-step binomial filter iteratively, we get an effective approximation of a Gaussian filter with a larger variance. And the approximation improves as we increase the number of iterations. We can make the Gaussian filter more efficient by leveraging separability. Here is a 3 by 3 binomial filter. This filter can be computed as the dot product of a column vector and a row vector. Instead of applying a 2D kernel to the entire image, we can filter the image along the x-axis first, then along the y-axis. The results are exactly the same as using the full 2D kernel, but this method is faster and more memory efficient. I hope you enjoy learning how blur filters work. It's incredible how we can model blurring as a linear and shift invariant system and gain insights from discrete Fourier transform. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.